To This Day is a speech slash poem written and performed by Shane Koiskin. I have chosen this speech because I feel the message it conveys is a message we choose to overlook in today's society. Physical abuse is often prioritized over psychological, and in my opinion, this is the harmarsha in our efforts to eradicate bullying. Psychological damage is as, if not more important than physical for numerous reasons. For example, in the case of psychological bullying, one cannot know the degree to which a person is in pain, or what they have endured. How can a scar left on the very thing that controls how we think, feel, act, and do be any less important than that on the body? I was once told, life is a state of mind. So how can you expect that life to be as bearable if the mind is being corrupted by the poisonous acts of those who choose to disregard a person's well-being? Why is it then that these acts are being brushed off with phrases like, get over it, with rhymes like sticks and stones? But speeches like this, they hold messages that prevent this. Step one to fighting bullying is awareness and recognition. And this is my attempt to do just that. This is my contribution to bringing awareness to all those left emotionally scarred, crying out internally to be understood and recognized, only to have their pleas ignored. If I can bring the message of this speech to one person, I have made a difference. The message that words like geek, slut, and fag do so much more damage than just a day of silence or sorrow. I will bring this message. This message must be publicized further. And though my contribution won't end here, here is where it begins. When I was a kid, I used to think that pork chops and karate chops were the same thing. I thought they were both pork chops. And because my grandmother thought it was cute, and because they were my favorite, she let me keep doing it. Not really a big deal. Until one day, before I realized fat kids are not designed to climb trees, I fell out of a tree, and I bruised the right side of my body. I didn't want to tell my grandmother because I was scared I'd get in trouble for playing somewhere I shouldn't have been. A few days later, the gym teacher noticed the bruise, and I was sent to the principal's office. From there, I was sent to another small room with a really nice lady who asked me all kinds of questions about my life at home. I saw no reason to lie. As far as I was concerned, life was pretty good. I told her, whenever I'm sad, my grandmother gives me karate chops. And this led to a full-scale investigation, and I was removed from my house for three days until they finally decided to ask how I got the bruise. News of this silly little story quickly spread through the school, and that's how I earned my first nickname, Porcha. But to this day, I hate pork chops. I'm not the only kid who grew up this way, surrounded by people who used to say that rhyme about sticks and stones, as if broken bones hurt more than the names we were called. And we were called them all. So we grew up believing no one would ever fall in love with us that we'd be lonely forever. That we'd never meet someone to make us feel like the sun was something they built for us in their tool shed. So broken heart strings bled the blues as we tried to empty ourselves so we would feel nothing. Don't tell me that hurts less than a broken bone. And an ingrown life is something surgeons can cut away. That there's no way for it to metastasize. It does. She was eight years old. Our first day of grade three, and someone called her ugly. We both got moved to the back of class so we would stop getting bombarded by spitballs, but the school halls were a battleground, and we found ourselves outnumbered day after wretched day. We had to stay inside for recess, because outside was worse. Outside we'd have to rehearse running away, or learn to stay still like statues, leaving no clues that we were there. In grade five, they taped a sign to the front of her desk that read, Beware of Dog. To this day, despite a loving husband, she doesn't think she's beautiful because of a birthmark that takes up a little less than half her face. Kids used to say she looks like a wrong answer someone tried to erase, but couldn't quite get the job done. And they'll never understand, she's raising two kids whose definition of beauty begins with the word mom. 
Because they see her heart before they see her skin. Because she's only ever always been amazing. He. Well, he was a broken branch grafted onto a different family tree. Adopted. Not because its parents opted for a different destiny. He was three when he became a mixed drink of one part left alone, two parts tragedy. Started therapy in eighth grade. Had a personality made up of tests and pills. Lived like the uphills were mountains and the downhills were cliffs. Four-fifths suicidal, a tidal wave of antidepressants, and an adolescence of being called pauper. One part because of the pills. Ninety-nine parts because of the cruelty. He tried to kill himself in grade ten. When a kid, when a kid who could still go home to mom and dad had the audacity to tell him, get over it. As if depression is something that can be remedied by any of the contents found in a first aid kit. To this day, he remains a stick of TNT lit from both ends. He could describe to you in detail the way the sky bends and the moment before it's about to fall. And the Spartan army of friends who I'll call him an inspiration. He remains a conversation piece between those who can't understand. Sometimes being drug free has less to do with addiction and more to do with sanity. We are not the only kids who grow up this way. To this day, kids are still being called names. Classics, hey stupid, hey spaz. Seems like every school has an arsenal of names getting updated year by year. And if a kid breaks at school and no one around chooses to hear, do they make a sound? Or are they just background noise to a soundtrack stuck on repeat saying things like, kids can be cruel. Every school was a big top circus tent. The pecking order? Acrobats, lion tamers, clowns, carnies. All of these miles ahead of who we were, we were freaks. Lobster clawed boys, bearded ladies, oddities juggling depression, loneliness, playing solitaire, spin the bottle, trying to kiss the wounded parts of ourselves and heal. But at night, while the others slept, we kept walking that tightrope. Yeah, some of us fell. But I want to let all of them know, all of this, all of this is just debris. Left over from the day we finally decide to smash all those things we thought we used to be. And if you can't see anything beautiful about yourself, get a better mirror. Look a little closer, stare a little longer, because there's something inside you that made you keep trying, despite everyone who told you to quit. You built a cast around your broken heart, and you signed it yourself. You signed it, they were wrong. Maybe you didn't belong to a group or a clique. Maybe they didn't pick you first for basketball or anything. Maybe you had to bring bruises, broken teeth to show and tell, but never told. How can you hold your ground when everyone around you wants to bury you beneath it? You have to believe they were wrong. They have to be wrong. Why else would we still be here? We grew up learning to cheer on the underdog, because we see ourselves in them. We stem from a root, planted in the belief that we are not what we were called. We're not stalled out cars sending empty on some highway. And then if some way we are, don't worry. We only got out to walk and get gas. We're graduating members from the class, but we made it. And not the faded echoes. Of voices crying out names will never hurt me. Of course, they did. But our lives will only ever, always, continue to be a balancing act that has less to do with pain and more to do with beauty.